I'm Kristen Denny Chambers and joining me is Brad Bain. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about his uh, mouthpieces and other equipment that he has and some teaching strategies. So Brad, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing right now. Hi Kristen, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invita invitation. Well, I am the principal clarinetist of the Oklahoma City Philharmonic Orchestra. And before that, I played clarinet with a variety of different orchestras from Tulsa to Savannah and freelancing uh, around the country. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts where I was uh, privileged to hear the Boston Symphony frequently. And um, my hero, Harold Wright, was the principal clarinetist at the time. And he helped just through his artistry. He formed my opinion of what kind of sound and artistry is important to me. I find him to be, uh, his sound is alive and ringing still in my mind's ear and it, it continues as an inspiration to me. I, when I went to college, I went to Northwestern University where I studied with Robert Marcellus. This was back in the late 80s. I won the, the uh, second knee flat clarinet position in the Tulsa Philharmonic in uh, 19, uh, 1990 where, and I started in the fall of 90. And later on, I met a young college student, Kristen Denny, at the University of Tulsa, but that's perhaps for another interview. Um, and uh, here I am in Oklahoma City now for about, uh, I think I'm starting my eighth year. Um, something that happened intermixed with all of it was, I, when I was in college, I uh, learned how to make clarinet reeds and uh, I was a, and continue to be a reed maker. It was a very important part of my uh, clarinet history. Um, but once I started with the Tulsa Philharmonic, my first professional job, I found that my practice room voice, my practice room sound that I had mastered in college, really was good for nothing on the job in an orchestra on stage with 60, 70, 80, 90 musicians, where I'm trying to propagate my sound out, get it out to the audience. So the little old lady in the audience can hear not just principal clarinet, but second clarinet as well. I think that the two, you know, the section, the woodwinds working with a, as, a, as a full body, um, it was a whole new territory. And in the second clarinet, you're lower and the sound doesn't project as much as the upper partials of the, of the principal. And so I needed to construct a sound which uh, a, transferred out into the hall better. And it was just, you know, something that I wanted to do. I wanted to, to, to get a sense that my sound was better serving the ensemble. And because I was a reed maker, I pushed that envelope as far as I could to try to get the resonance that was needed, but I found it wasn't enough. And I, being a tinkerer with my hands, I started tinkering around with uh, mouthpieces. Well, one thing led to another. I soon learned that I had a great passion for mouthpieces. And uh, I started searching from Milwaukee to St. Louis to Boston to Los Angeles, pawn shops and music stores and people and eBay and everything, building a collection of junker mouthpieces, some precious mouthpieces as well. And I analyzed them, measured them, and in some cases, many cases, refaced them. Thousands and thousands of hours on the bench. Later, I uh, started refacing mouthpieces for um, people around the country and then around the world. And eventually, after the uh, Tulsa Philharmonic folded and then the Savannah, Phil Savannah Symphony Orchestra folded soon thereafter um, rather than uh, withering away my life savings on food and shelter I decided to put it towards something meaningful and that was to make my own mouthpiece from scratch and so I reverse engineered uh, a, an on reschedule mouthpiece um, both in its design as well as its material to begin the production of my own proprietary mouthpieces called the Vintage Collection, which is now, I have the Epic line of mouthpieces, which uh, faithfully uh, falls within that vintage category of uh, mouthpieces, sound and uh, design both. And uh, so now I have um, a full-time mouthpiece business uh, where I also offer bells and barrels and reeds for sale of my own design as well as uh, the, the symphony orchestra, the Oklahoma City Philharmonic, two uh, very important uh, um, jobs that serve one another. I can go to the orchestra and test my stuff. 
and I can then bring my observations on stage at home on to the bench and apply uh, the things that I observed, the sounds, the acoustics, the response, the propagation, and apply that into my mouthpieces that I make for sale. Wonderful. That must have been a very long journey. <laughs> It was just as long, maybe even a little longer than my story. I'm sorry that I was so long-winded about it, but it gets me excited. I could probably go on for days. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your concept of sound and how that has informed how you have designed your mouthpieces. So my concept of sound is, is that of uh, what I learned from uh, hearing uh, Harold Wright and studying with Robert Marcellus. And the way I would describe it is that uh, it's got to be, uh, there's got to be a clarity. The sound has to be clean and constructed with ease and comfort and a full rich palette of overtones from the low all the way up to the highs, N nothing cut out. It's celebrating the truth in the clarinet playing experience. All the, all the overtones are welcome. When you're working with people who say come to your table at a convention or they call you on the phone and say, I want to try some mouthpieces, how do you approach working with people who might have a slightly different concept of sound than yours? And especially if they're wanting you to reface their mouthpiece, how does that conversation go? Well, that's a very interesting question. Well, first of all, my concept of sound is, is one that I said welcomes all the overtones. And I think that these days, uh, a lot of the younger players, especially, they're trying to do something to their sound to make the clarinet perhaps different than what I believe it truthfully is. And that is they're trying to darken the sound to a point, well, to, a, to a, where it's flawed, where, you, where you're eliminating so many of the upper partials that the clarinet no longer is sounding like a clarinet. These people, their inspiration is perhaps to sound more like a horn or an alto saxophone. To, to me, uh, if you would just generically think of the sound as part horn and part oboe, and you blend the two sounds together and you get the clarinet. So we'll start with a horn, and then you gradually EQ the, the oboe into the mix. That's my concept. Now, when I work with different different people, they might be all, oh. So I could actually ask them, what's your vowel sound? When you play the clarinet, just a little quick interview, quick two minute discussion, what do you want to sound like? Are you an O guy or are you an E guy? Or are you a U woman? You can, you can have uh, a very unique um, character in your, in your sound and have a very strong concept of, of your vowel and that would be the next the next part of the conversation. But, but the first thing I need to know is, are you an O or are you an E? Or are you something in between? Interestingly, when we play the clarinet, when we shape the sound in our mouths, I can move my tongue from E, O, E, O. It's hard for me to go O without moving my face. So we clarinet teachers often describe we have to have a high tongue position, that of the vowel sound E. But it's interesting. I mean, I've worked with people from Sydney, Sydney, Australia, for example. And I said, so what's your vowel sound? Oh, it's got to be an O. And I, said, and I think, well, okay, great. So I'm going to step onto another pair of tracks and work for you to, to help generate your O concept. But I think, you know, what are you doing inside your mouth if you've got e -yaw, e -yaw, those two vowel shapes in, in your oral cavity that you, at your disposal? How do you produce O? I mean, where's the truth there? Well, I think he's now dealing with the amount of pressure on the reed, or oh, you know something something like that. So, also I should say that sometimes if some if somebody's concept is really far from mine, if we don't share anything similar, I might say, well, you, this is this is what I think is as far in your direction as I'm comfortable making, and uh, if if it's not for you, I'd be glad to refer you to somebody who I think might better suit your concept. But I do have some um, flexibility in, in how I approach um, my craft and you know all those hours uh, for the 10, 12 years on the bench just doing refacing before I started making my own mouthpieces. 
it was a great uh, learning experience where I got all sorts of different mouthpieces with different internal shapings and different sounds when you blow into them. Mouthpiece X has more of an O sound and mouthpiece Y has more of an E sound. Well, why? And then you start evaluating it, measuring it, and doing a little refacing, and you learn the causes and effects of your craft. And so then I'll apply what I've learned over those hours on the bench and uh, put it into the mouthpiece that I'm making for my customer. And, um, you know, the conversation doesn't stop with the mouthpiece. We'll talk about reads, and sometimes I'll work with somebody, and well, frequently, and I'll say, here, try this read. Maybe that'll help get you the, 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 the vowel sound that you're looking for without sacrificing response or without adding unnecessary resistance. You know, re by the way, on resistance and, and uh, freedom, there, you've got to have the right balance. There's, you've got to have a little bit of resistance, working resistance, something to blow into that can help give you a safe platform for your artistry to unfold. But you also want freedom so that when you put your energy into the instrument, it's going out through the instrument without interference. You don't want anything to hold you back uh, negatively. You just want something that will contain you in a, in a positive way. Uh, but back to, to the customers, um, I have my area that I'm comfortable working left or right from my true concept of sound. And uh, beyond that, I'll work with them. I'll interview them to, and, and discuss with them how, how maybe there's somebody else that might better serve, serve their uh, concept. That's not too common. I'm, I'm pretty versatile. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're very, you know, accommodating. And if, if you realize that something just isn't going to quite work for a client, you know, it's nice that you um, aren't so hung up on your stuff that you, you can recommend somebody else. So that's, that's really nice that you can do that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for me that the, the word truth in everything is, is really important to me. You know, I've had students who just have a natural who they are, their, their, their mouth construction and, you know, the physique and, and the musculature and everything. Uh, somebody has a naturally perhaps mellower sound and somebody else might naturally have a, a more brilliant quality of sound. And I'm not going to try to make everybody exactly the same mold of, of what I want to sound like. What, what I want to have is um, they, they need to be able to do a variety of things. Uh, they need to be able to play really quiet with clarity and cleanliness in their tone. And they need to be able to play full resonance, full volume on the clarinet with good intonation. You know, it doesn't, I don't want it to blow flat. And with a good quality, spread free. I do not want spread. Spread is, is awful. And so uh, if, they can, if they can do that, then that, they check that box. Um, I want them to be able to have... Um, uh, like I said, a, a clean and clear sound. And that usually, usually comes from the reed selection. There's nothing I like less than the sound of effort. <laughs> and I hear it out of a lot of clarinetists. And that comes from this crazy thing that people want to play on reeds that are too hard. I think it goes back to that sense of resistance and safety. Um, again, I, I think working resistance is important to give you a sense of, of comfort, but it, it shouldn't dampen and mute your artistry. I mean, if somebody's spending, say, say a person has this much energy, and if they're using this much of their, their resources to make a tone, they only have this much left to make art. Mm -hmm. Well, if it takes this much energy to make a tone, look at that. That's a much more meaningful Musician, that person has room to do stuff. And so the truth in the clarinet is very simple. If you can't make a loud pretty and a soft pretty sound, you're not, um, you're not succeeding. You're not able to play the clarinet properly. And so we have to fix that. Another thing is you've got to be able to play a certain length of time on a single breath. For me, the litmus test, there are two. I want to be able to do the A clarinet solo from Brahms' third symphony, on the first movement. I want to be able to do it on one breath. There is no good place to take a breath. Let's be realistic. Sure, we can sneak one in, but if I can't play that solo on one breath, 
then I'm playing a read that's too hard. Maybe hard is not the right word. The, that piece of cane is not with as much vitality and, and efficiency. And so I'll find a read that allows me to do it. Another one is in the Nutcracker, there's a, a little passage that, that's, a, that's a half page, the bottom half of like the third or fourth page. And you, you play a, a long articulated thing with uh, the bassoon and then it on it go, with the woodwind tutti section. And um, I'm not going to try to sing it to you, but um, it's three, four pages in and it's on the left hand side and it's the bottom half of the page. It's a long blow. That piece, anything by Tchaikovsky is a long blow. And Nutcracker, you do that piece two times a day, a gajillion times every December, and it's fatiguing. And I need to have a setup, a mouthpiece read combination that will allow me to do it and have enough energy to come home and have a beer. Not only finish that excerpt, but the rest of the concert. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, basically I want to find various truths in the clarinet playing experience and solve them. And if I can, and if I have the ability to play a long time on one breath, if I have the ability to play loud and soft on one breath, if I have the ability to produce a sound that is clean and without effort, then I'm, I'm pretty much doing everything that I want to do. And also I need to be able to articulate. There are certain passages in the orchestral repertoire that are basic litmus tests as well. The Mendelssohn Scherzo, you know, if I've got a read that'll do that, I'm ahead of the game. Uh, if, uh, you know, if I've got a read that'll let me play the first phrase of the Mozart clarinet concerto, I think that that articulation, get it just right with a sweet nuance, um, I'm ahead of the game. So part of, part of uh, you know, what's important to me in shaping and the sound is just, I have to be able to succeed on the various demands of the repertoire. And if I can do all of those things with one read in one session, I feel like I'm doing great. <laughs> all right, well, I would love to know a little bit more about your, your new barrels and your bells and maybe a little bit about the new reads that you'll have uh, next week in Orlando. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. Yeah, I will be in Orlando at the International Clarinet Association and I'd like to invite all the viewers and listeners out there to come and pay a visit at my booth. Um, and uh, you don't have to buy anything. Just come on over and say hello and say you saw this uh, interview. Let me know and let Kristen uh, know how, how we did. Um, but yeah, so I have um, this, it's important to me that the sound propagation be comfortable and that the sound be centered. Remember I sang that vowel sound, oh, the center has to be easier to produce. That's very important to me. If, if the sound is more brought in, I'm, I feel like my equipment is doing what it's meant to do. And so I started, uh, after the mouthpieces, I started with barrels. And I have two different barrels. They're both the opposite of whatever everyone else is doing. And that is to say, they're both low mass instead of, put it over here where you can see instead of high mass barrels. The one here is lower mass, obviously, it's got the hourglass shape than this one. They share the same bore, the same internal dimensions. However, the lower mass of this barrel produces a different sound and a different feel than this one. Um, and it's also lighter weight. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. But um, what might you think, you know, the, the bigger the mass, which is very popular these days with other barrel makers that want to make a big chunky, well, two things. One, they have to make, a, if they're making it out of wood, they have to make it certain body size just to help stabilize it for two things. One, to help prevent likelihood of cracking, and second, or two, to um, uh, help keep the bore stable. You know, wood has an axis, ac axis and it, uh, will expand and contract at two different rates because of the, um, it's easier to expand with the grain than against the grain. And so um, by increasing the mass, the body, the bulk of, the, of a wood barrel, it helps keep that bore shape in line and uh, without becoming ovoid. And uh, wood has a lot of issues with it. 
uh, which my barrels are rubber, which um, it's, it's going to keep the same dimensions. It won't blow out. And um, uh, it's more stable than wood and uh, lower mass than wood. And the contrary to popular thinking, a, a low mass barrel with thinner walls, one might think it'll be a thinner sound or um, brighter or shriller sounding. It's just the opposite, actually. Um, this the skinnier barrel, for me, plays fuller and bigger. They're both, because of the, the way I voice the bores, they're both very centered. And I, I call it, it brings a level of autofocus into the playing experience more than any other barrel I've ever experienced. And uh, that's to, to the point, that's the, the, to the concept of everything that I do, autofocus. If, if it focuses for me, then I don't have to be at the playing experience like this. You know, that's a 10, right? The, cl the human being wants to be a two. Right, that all goes back to your whole um, concept of effort. <laughs> right, yeah, concept of effort. Well, if a human being can naturally comfortably produce a two and has to go through great extent to be at a 10 to produce the focus that the clarinet, proper clarinet tone deserves, if the mouthpiece and the barrel and the bell and the instrument can help alleviate the burden of work, uh, all the better. And so, you know, frankly, I tell my students, what's your number? And the, and the students, well, you know, it should be a six. And I'm like, well, you sound like a five, give me a seven or an eight. And um, uh, that's a lot, that's a lot to ask for somebody to do. I mean, can you imagine doing a recital an hour and a half long where you're up here like this producing an eight? It's hard, it's hard to be proper on the clarinet. The clarinet was not meant it does not gel with the human playing experience, with the human condition, I should say. The, the, the playing experience requires more of us than we want to give it. And so I'm trying to find a way to make it easier. Um, so this barrel has a little bit, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit slower to get up to speed. This one's really quick and, and lively responding. And some people like a little bit of dampening and some people want just full, full speed ahead. Um, you know, I thought, think about the playing experience um, you know, a lot of times people playing reeds that are a little too heavy, uh, it's, it's really hard to modulate the playing experience from zero to 30 miles an hour. And then from 30 miles an hour, you know, it's like, it's on, and then you can go all the way up to, to full forte. Well, 99% I, I, of our, our artistry comes in how we treat that uh, zero to 30 miles an hour. And I should also say, the, how we treat the phrase ending is nine tenths of our phrases su success or failure. That's what the human ear remembers. So if you do a flat phrase and then all of a sudden you do this beautifully shaped, lovely taper at the end, you're gonna win over the audience, <laughs> even though you play re relatively stiff. <laughs> Add that extra 90% that precedes the taper and now you're gold. But the taper requires mastery from the 30 miles an hour down to zero miles an hour. And I think that um, that requires a reed that's lively, has the zing and the cane, and then you just voice it with the embouchure in such a way as to let it vibrate, and then you control it as you taper for pitch and for clarity. I talk to my students often about, you know, if there's a little bit of the sound of air going through the instrument, but I know because they're, you know, we've been talking about reeds and things. I know they're not using necessarily a reed that's too hard or, or anything. I say, clarify the sound. I say, well, what does that mean? And I'll just take my clarinet and I'll play a low E and it's kind of sounding and I'll sort of shape the, the voice, the, the low E, and all of a sudden it just becomes rich. It's being nimble and nuanceable with the embouchure that gives all those details. And that's all about the zero to 30 miles an hour. How you start the phrase and how you end the phrase is more important than the stuff that happens in the middle. Granted, it's all important, but a great setup is going to give you so much more in those subtle details, the zero to 30 mile realm, than um, a setup which is not, as, not, not functioning as well. Back to your question the bell. 
So this bell, I don't know if you can see it, or just above that sticker, there's a little hole here. And so I make bells with a tiny little hole, and I make some without. Both bells have the same bore shape. First of all, these are also made from hard rubber rods, which I CNC machine down to this shape. But there's no heavy metal ring. Um, it's, a, it's very lightweight. When you equip your clarinet with my bell and with my barrel, the instrument is noticeably lighter and it's, it's a lot easier on the arms and the elbow. I had tennis elbow, which um, lasted about 18 months. And that was, you know, that's basically you feel the pain right in your elbow and anything from holding a, a, a drink to putting the mouthpiece onto the instrument um, can be a hardship, painful. And so, um, and I, I developed it because I was during, it was during a period of time when I was practicing a lot and I was practicing standing without a neck strap. I was trying to build up the muscles so I felt comfortable holding the instrument. Well, I overdid it and I ended up uh, regretting that decision. So along the way, I decided I would make some lighter weight stuff to make it easier to, for us, you know, weaklings to be able to hold the instrument for a long, long period of time without causing problems. Um, so the, 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 the bore of my bell is smaller uh, than a, a standard bell. And what that does is it auto focuses. It brings the sound in place in such a way that I don't need to play at a 10. I can be a little bit more relaxed with my embouchure. You know, the, 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 everything about the clarinet tone is um, with that reed and embouchure um, contact point. It's kind of where, uh, from a car analogy, it's where your tire hits the road. And um, if you overinflate your tire or underinflate your tire, you'll have a, a different driving experience. Well, here, let's take it to a bicycle analogy. If you take a bicycle with a big, uh, big tires, low, uh, low tire pressure, like the old one sweet, one speed Schwinn bicycle from the Leave It to Beaver television show era, the 1950s. You can imagine it's very smooth. It's a, it's a you know, it smooths out the, the undulations, the, the bumps, the cracks in the road, but it takes a fair amount of pedal force energy to get moving. But then on the other hand, if you take a Lance Armstrong racing bicycle with very skinny tire and very high pressure, you, know, you can just touch the pedal and whoosh, off he goes. That's very efficient, um, low rolling resistance. Well, you know, how I form my embouchure on the reed can affect how the reed vibrates. If I want to dampen the reed's vibration or if I want to celebrate the reed's vibration, it has something to do uh, with that contact, both the point up and down on the reed as well as the, uh, the pressure uh, in words on the reed. And now we're getting out into the weeds on clarinet pedagogy. I'd be glad to talk more about that. But uh, suffice it to say, the, my equipment focuses so I can be a little bit more relaxed here and comfortable. Okay. We do have one Facebook question from Bob Yoon. He did want to know exactly what is the weight of your barrels and bells, and maybe if you have a comparison to like a standard barrel and bell, uh, what the difference would be on the weight. I'll have to get back with you on that. I actually haven't measured it. I just know that when I uh, hold the instrument and then go to a normal instrument, there's a big difference. Um, uh, I can get a scale and weigh it and, I'll, and I will uh, give you those differences, uh, but I don't want to take the time of the interview to do it, to do that right now. Sure, we can add that to the conversation uh, when I post the video on Facebook. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, one more question about uh, mouthpieces and things like that. You know, the conference is coming up next week. And of course, there's always the, the Friday, the high school day. So there'll probably be a lot of young players coming through on that day. What advice would you give, you know, a younger high school player who, who knows they need to um, have a better mouthpiece and they have no idea where to start? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I remember when I was in high school and I was really interested in getting a new mouthpiece, go figure. Um, <laughs> and I remember my teacher said, well, why, why do you need it? Why do you want a new mouthpiece? And I just felt like for some reason I needed one. I, I felt like I could get a better sound if I could get a new mouthpiece, but I didn't know anything at that time. You know, a sophomore in high school, you know, I, I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew everything about life when I was a sophomore in high school. But now I look back um, at that period of time because I knew nothing. And, <laughs> Um, 
I think that high school players, younger players should not buy anything without their teacher's input. Um, because the teacher knows that they're, they're paying that person presumably to give them advice and counsel. So um, I'm happy to meet with uh, a high school player and, and chat with them about mouthpieces and answer any questions and welcome them to try my mouthpieces and they can see for themselves, you know, their mouthpiece versus my mouthpiece. You can try my read, do the whole, do the whole experience. But I would say, do you have a teacher? Can, before you buy anything, can we make sure that this is going to be acceptable from your teacher's point of view? That's who uh, ultimately should be in charge of those decisions, I think. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, there's so much unknown out there, especially from a younger player's point of view, it can be a little bit scary. And uh, I think the best way to um, have, develop a sense of confidence with equipment is to just get out there and, and try things and develop your own sense of what you like and then try to uncover the reasons why. Always ask why. Even if your teacher says, you know, I think, I remember my teacher, Robert Marcellus, um, uh, Schubert's Ninth Symphony, the A clarinet solo, dee, dee, dee. You, have to, you have to just hold a, a B for a long time. And the, the danger on A clarinet on that note is that you might grunt, there might be a little, point at which the sound decays to a point where you just get a <clears throat> kind of a subtone. And he said, well, you use firmer upper lip. And I said, okay, problem solved. Wow, I've got a good B now. Well, a few years later, I, I said to myself, what was that about? Why would my upper lip have anything to do with that where the tire meets the road? That's where everything matters. The, where my bottom lip and reed are making contact. So I explored it and I, so basically I was asking why. And then, I, and then I decided that by firming the upper lip, the bottom lip moved along the way in parity with the, uh, with the upper lip. You see, when I firm my upper lip, the bottom lip gets firmer as well. So he was saying an indirect route to get firm and to support and that solve the problems. And, and I think that um, uh, I now have a, a better understanding of the clarinet playing experience because I asked why. I certainly didn't have a better understanding of the clarinet playing experience because I said yes sir to my teacher. And he was a phenomenal teacher. He was in my view the best there was. Um, so I should have been a better student. I should have said, well, why? <laughs> and then heard what his explanation was. Wow, that my conversation with you now would have been so much more interesting if I could relay that conversation. Uh, so, uh, you know, try to learn the truth. Try to figure out what is the truth of the matter. Um, and so the younger players, those high school students, if they're going out there and they're trying different gear and then they go home and they can start simmering on it and thinking about it, wow, I tried this Bane mouthpiece and it, sounded so much more this and I tried a so-and-so's mouthpiece and it was so much more that. Well, why? Well, that conversation I had or with this read or whatever. And then when it comes time for them in their years fast forward and they're playing clarinet in a symphony orchestra and they realize they need a new, need a new clarinet or a new mouthpiece or whatever, they have experiential knowledge and a better sense of understanding of why things work and they can pick out their gear with confidence. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who pick professional instrument pickers and professional, uh, you know, they have service to, uh, to help people who don't have that level of confidence. And it's a wonderful thing that they can um, serve the clarinet community in a way where their, their knowledge can, can illuminate uh, the uh, recipient um, in such a way that the, the recipient would never have the, the ability to do it on their own. Okay, that's wonderful advice. And, you know, with my own students, I, I try to think about the same idea. You know, they're often asking me, what ligature should I get? What mouthpiece should I get? And I'll, I'll talk about a few different things, but I'll say, you know, the really the best experience is going to be for you to just try a bunch of stuff. You know, you can get all the opinions you want from this person and that person, but if you don't try it yourself, 
how are you going to know? <laughs> That's right. That's right. I should say, uh, from a teaching point of view, you know, a younger, underdeveloped player, they don't have necessarily the embouchure development or even right. consistency with reads to be able to make the decision. And so I, I'm perhaps a minority in the, in the teaching pedagogy point of view to, I'll just tell them, this is what you need. Of course, you know, I have a very strong concept of what kind of mouthpiece, what kind of facing will serve this kind of player. And so I, I have the ability to pick for them. And I think they're very well served for that because, you know, a, a young student who may try 10 different mouthpieces from 10 different manufacturers, of, they're, they're just going to get, it's going to be luck of the draw. They're going to end up with the mouthpiece that that read of the day and that underdeveloped embouchure seems to function with. That doesn't mean it's the best choice for them. It just means that on that day, it produced a more pleasing sound. I should go one step further. In Oklahoma City, um, one of the first things that uh, band directors oftentimes do for prospective students is they'll just have like an assembly and they'll have these kids, random kids, go through the line and blow into a saxophone and then blow into a clarinet, blow into an oboe. And then whichever instrument the kid sounds better on, well, that, maybe that'll be the instrument you can pick next year when you start the band. And I think that's ridiculous. It's just, you know, like who knows what that read condition is. If it's a read that's any good at all to begin with, let alone, you know, does it have a big chip or a gash on it? You know, and a, t a kid who knows nothing about producing a good embouchure is blowing into an oboe, a double reed instrument, which I think has some, some spe specificity with respect to how you approach it here. And they may or may not get a sound. And now the band director is saying, oh, you produce a good sound on an oboe, you should be an oboe player. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It sh it, that, that assembly should not happen. <laughs> my opinion uh, anyway so I, I as a teacher I know a lot more than my underdeveloped student and so I will be very proactive and saying this is what I want you to, to play on because this is going to get you where we want you to be with the uh, greatest uh, efficiency with the, in the quickest amount of time trust me I know <laughs> That's especially true for a student who, like you said, has an underdeveloped embouchure. Um, you know, when I was saying, you know, just go out and try things, I, mostly I was referring to, you know, maybe my older students who are pretty refined and, you know, they're ready to explore on their own. Um, but, you know, of course, if you know what the perfect fit is, you've got to suggest that too. Yeah, yeah. So we teachers, we have to be uh, always evaluating at what stage is the, is the student in and how can we better serve their curiosity and uh, their developmental needs. Yeah, I love it when uh, at the conferences the this, this student community comes through and sometimes you have some people that are really shy to try things and other times they just want to, they're like a bull in a china shop. They want to try everything and um, they love it all or, you know, they're shy and they don't like anything because they're kind of not very comfortable in the circumstance. But in both cases, I try to just make it fun. Ultimately, I, I, the more you try and the more, the more you'll learn and the better you'll be for it. Great. Well, speaking of students, um, I do have a few teaching questions for you. Um, we'll try to keep these a little brief. Um, but if you could share with us a little bit about how you help your own students hone in on their concept of sound. Yeah, so I mentioned that, you know, my concept of sound that horn and oboe in combination is, is what guides me. I should also say of equal importance is that truth word. It needs to be um, working properly, the setup. It, and, and, I, and I always find it amazing that um, in, in studio class, for example, when I was teaching at the university, um, you know, a young player who doesn't really know anything, I, can very easily evaluate if somebody's working too hard or not. So that's the first thing that, that I do. As I, we don't really talk about concept of sound or anything. I just, I just go through with the class and, and each of us will play a couple of notes and then we'll, we'll all as a group evaluate, is, is that person's read too hard, too soft, or just right? And then everybody gets to, to, to make an input, input and then we go around the room. And nine times out of 10, we're all in agreement. Um, we can hear it. 
if the read is too soft or the read is too hard. And so what I, you know, for the, for the beginning, I'm just trying to get people on whatever their mouthpiece is on a read that's vibrating in the right strength. And then we're getting closer to the truth. What is then the right, the right kind of concept of sound? Well, it's one that resonates efficiently and with, with clarity. And then can you have a full range of dynamics? Can you play with a certain amount of time on one breath? Oh, another one is the Behrman book three. Can you play the scale up and down, up and down, all on one breath uh, at a certain tempo, or 104 for the uh, quarter note? Um, so I have my students do that. And if they can't, then we work on it, take, how to take a big breath. By the way, breathing. Some, sometimes teachers talk about diaphragmatic breathing and all of these things. I think it's a lot more effective if you just say, take a yawn, but put power behind it. You know, so instead of inhaling from somewhere here that you don't even know what anatomically it is, if you just breathe like it's a yawn, but really make it fast and powerful, you're pretty much doing it right. And that's everybody, you know, we were masters of yawning since we've been born. So everything in teaching is more effective if communicated from a point of familiarity. And so if we can create a, a learning atmosphere, a learning environment that allows the student to take on things they already know, it becomes um, much more meaningful to them. A breath from a yawn. Wow, that's pretty cool. Or, oh yeah, I know what it feels like to play on a read that's too hard. And soon, really soon, my students hate just as much as I hate the sound of inefficiency, of the sound of effort yeah. and fuzz and that kind of tonal inclusions which are unpleasant. People say the phrase, there's too much crap in that sound. Well, we try to eliminate that. And once we've done that, along with those other litmus tests, length on one breath, full range of dynamics and so forth, then we start talking about the concept of sound. And I think that's where I have to demonstrate you know, a sound which is spread is what typically is the problem for most younger players. And so then I, sh I show, I'll play a sound which is spread and then I'll play with the kind of sound that Marcellus or Harold Wright produced. Hopefully I'll try anyway to produce that, that type of sound. And then they hear it, it's right there. It's right in their mind's ear. And then they go home and they think about it. And then over the course of weeks, they get it. What skill or concept do you find is one of the hardest things to teach to students and how do you go about facing that challenge? You know, the thing, you know, being a teacher, I've talked with a lot of my teacher colleagues who um, aren't just clarinet teachers, but might be brass teachers or other wind instruments. And I think the, the universal thing that we all share is, you know, from younger players all along to a, to a highly developed player is getting them to use their air, their air and their wind in a way that has support and consistency and vigor. Um, so that's sort of like the common thread that we all share as wind teachers. And it seems like it should be so easy, you know, just blow. Well, if there's more to it than that. That's the thing because you know, especially as I might be getting a younger player who's been playing on reads that are too hard, I might be encouraging them to play on a read that's a little, little lighter, and then they end up consequently backing down on the, on the end, wind because it's easier, and that's something that we have to be very careful to manage. So some teachers actually move students up to a heavier read because they're trying to get them to use, blow through the read and develop a certain amount of air uh, support um, both ways can be effective. Uh, I just, I don't like the consequence of, of that effort that the harder read produces. So I just hound them on. Yes, a lighter read needs support as well. Um, but, you know, wind, there's more to it than just blowing. And um, using the air in an artistic way is, is I think, very, very important. Um, I, I, talk, I use a phrase called a microburst, and that's where you use the wind to help navigate some occasionally technically demanding things, perhaps going above and below, navigating the third register up in the altissimo and then, and then down below. Sometimes there can be response issues. And so if you can just blow through that 
that nimble passage in such a way as to keep the wind so well supported that the note will come out regardless. Um, sometimes requires more than just a steady supported airstream, but it needs a burst. So if I'm blowing, that's exaggerated, but that sort of uh, kind of air which um, uh, comes with little bursts is, is a very useful tool to navigate through technical problems. And of course, in artistic musical passages as well, when we want to accent something, uh, but um, you know, what kind of an accent, a hard one or a soft one or, or something in between, requires that manipulation of the wind. And you know, that requires demonstration and um, uh, you know, games to try, to try to employ it. I'll show you if you've got a minute, I'll put my mouthpiece on, I'll just really quickly demonstrate something that I do with my students to try to explore the, the beginning of, the, of this microburst in a musical setting. Microburst, the first one. Can you hear that? Yes, definitely. Okay. So now we'll, do, we'll and then we'll everybody in the room will do that. We'll 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 give a, a burst on the first one, and then I'll say now let's burst the second one. And then everybody will do it, and then we'll go and do the third one. mix it all up. And then you can now create music. That's Schubert. I don't know if that was coming across on the speaker, but the idea is to introduce manipulating the air and support of the air in a musical context. I think everything in teaching is sticks more with the student if you're doing it through musical endeavors, if you're, if you're putting music behind it rather than just for technical stuff. Of course. <laughs> so the wind, the, it's all about the wind and, and we can discuss the wind in ways that are much more than just wind, but music. All right, well, I think we have a couple of questions to close out um, this lovely discussion we've had so far. Um, one which is just always makes me curious, how did you come to play the clarinet? Wow, uh, so when I was in the fourth grade, um, I, there was an assembly and <laughs> this was the good kind of assembly where we didn't play the instruments, but we heard them. Mm. And I heard the oboe and I just thought, wow, I love the sound of the oboe. And I went home and I said to my father, I want to play the oboe. And he says, no, you don't. All the oboe players I knew in college were nuts. Play the clarinet. You know, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, the king of swing, the master of the altissimo register. And I thought, okay, <laughs> when you're in the fourth grade, your father can say nothing wrong. And uh, well, I got the clarinet and I started taking lessons and I was a little bit of a slow, I, it was slow to take off. But when I, you know, I, I took lessons and things, but really I got most interested in the clarinet when I was in high school. And I, and I got a new, new clarinet teacher and we started talking about sound and, and I started listening to Harold Wright and you know, all of these things really uh, took meaning to me. Wonderful. Um, and then the last question is, um, tell us a little bit about some ideas that you might have for clarinet teachers, professionals, just all of us in the industry, how we can make music and the clarinet in general um, more accessible to the general public so that our industry can grow and we can thrive. Yeah, that's tricky because the industry is having some trouble. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, there are a lot of young players, you know, the band programs and the orchestra programs around the country. Um, but along the way, as you get higher up that, that pyramid, um, uh, you know, in orchestras, for example, few of them really have very strong financials where they've got solid footing, solid foundation, and, you know, there are very few orchestra positions in the country where you can actually make a living. Um, you know, there's also college teaching and uh, 
recital performing and, and, and being a soloist is extremely difficult to, to find a, a career in. So how do we get more orchestras and how do we get more um, uh, ways to, to, have a, to make a living in, in the industry? Well, first of all, I think there are very few musicians who are only doing one thing, and that is playing their instrument. More and more, we are entrepreneurs. We teach. We might play in an orchestra and teach at the university and maybe have a private student studio at home. Um, uh, many also have other small businesses. I have my own business, uh, Bain Mouthpieces, uh, which is uh, clarinetmouthpiece.com or bainmouthpieces.com. Either website will get you there, clarinetmouthpiece.com. Um, and other, like I have a colleague in the orchestra who's a photographer and he does beautiful portrait photography. His name is Michael Anderson, by the way, for those of you that might be looking. Um, and uh, uh, the tuba player has two yoga studios in Oklahoma City. And many of my colleagues are also college professors or area band directors. And um, they, they all play wonderfully. And I think they managed amazingly well in, uh, in to maintain their uh, artistry, uh, their instrumental uh, skills at the highest level, and also to find other ways to uh, to make ends meet, have these other jobs which they've thrived at as well. And, and I'm so impressed by that. Um, so one way that we can make the industry thrive is, is to find ways to survive. And um, being uh, entrepreneurial is, is crucial part of that. And I think in this country, better than just about any other, we have opportunities. It's the ground is well laid for our entrepreneurial spirit to blossom. Um, but also I think that we need to share. And you know, if we can do concerts for young people and plant that seed, that you give them the spark, um, it's very important. I used to play in a trio, the Council Oak Trio, when I was living in, in Tulsa, we played many concerts to area school children and library concerts and things like that. And thank goodness there was some support and some funding to make those concerts uh, possible. Um, so uh, the more uh, opportunities uh, for those things, the better. But we also had to put the concert together and, and find the, the sources of funding. So it takes work. Um, and I credit my colleagues for that more than my own, uh, the work that I put in on that, I, I have to say. I was kind of preoccupied with other things, namely my mouthpiece business, but fortunately my colleagues were really good at finding us work. Um, and, um, you know, we do this thing, music, because we love it. And I think the more we just share the spirit of love for their, our craft, it's contagious. So the more we get out there and, and be true to that spark, the better. And, I don't have all the answers. This is just thoughts. <laughs> I'm curious to know what others have to say because um, music is something that's extremely precious to our to the soul, the human condition. At weddings, at funerals, at most important inaugurations, <laughs> at the most meaningful, important chapters. Uh, first sentences of each chapter and finishing sentence of each chapter of life is music. And I think that the more the common person knows that this is not just a fun hobby, but a profession, the better. I totally agree. And I think about music also to the lay person, you know, it's one of those things that they may not notice in the moment, but you certainly notice if it's not there. That's right. Well, Brad, thank you so much for joining me in this interview. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week and I hope um, we'll all get there safely. And um, anybody who has any other questions for Brad, please post them on the Facebook page after I post the video and we'll get back to you and keep the discussion going. Thank you so much, Brad. It was a pleasure, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you very much.